Good afternoon everyone. I Disha Pandey, Assistant Professor, Parul Institute of Law, Parul University. Welcome you all to the today's webinar on criminal justice system. Parul Institute of Law has been organizing webinars with distinguished legal, uh, legal and social luminaries, judges, senior advocates, academicians and law professors. Our esteemed guest and speaker for today's webinar is Mr. Shekhar Napade, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India. Sir, uh, you need no introduction though, but I would take this opportunity to briefly introduce you. Sir has completed his law from Government Law College, Mumbai and joined the bar in the year 1974. Initially, Sir worked with Justice B. N. Shri Krishna, who subsequently became the Supreme Court judge. Sir was also a visiting faculty at Government Law College. Sir started appearing in the Supreme Court cases in the 1979 itself. Because of his remarkable knowledge of law and classic court mannerism, he gained a lot of love and respect from everyone. Some of the famous Supreme Court cases in which Sir has appeared are Jayalalitha's disproportionate asset case, Board of Control for Cricket in India case, Impeachment Proceedings for Removal of Justice Somitra Sen, Judge Calcutta High Court, Maharashtra Bar Dancer case, and the very famous Aruna Shambhag case. Uh, with this introduction, I would, uh, I would seek your permission that uh, uh, we can begin. But before that, I would, I would request Professor Dr. Debrati Haldar, Professor Paru Institute of Law. Ma'am, uh, please welcome, sir. Uh, very good afternoon, sir. On behalf of Parul Institute of Law, Parul University, we all welcome you, sir, in this webinar, and we are eagerly waiting to hear from you, sir. Welcome, sir. Can I start? Yes, yes, sir. Sure, sir. Uh, at the outset, my apologies uh, that I have to address you on a mobile something with which I am not very comfortable. But uh, there is a principle known in law as doctrine of necessity. So, uh, complying with that principle, I am attempting to put across uh, what my views are on the criminal law practice. There are three basic things which we must remember one is the substantive law that is a law which defines an offense now we have indian penal code it deals with traditional offenses like cheating criminal breach of trust murder causing grievous hurt so on and so forth then we have new set of laws like prevention of money laundering, prevention of corruption act, which deal with economic offenses. Then we have some new additional criminal offenses like organized crime act. Now organized crime act is there practically in all states. It started in Maharashtra, then it uh, it was taken up in Karnataka. Karnataka also has Kakoka. Maharashtra has Makoka. And Gujarat also now you have Gakoka. So, so therefore, the first element in practice is your, you must be familiar with the substantive law. That is one aspect. The second aspect is, how do you deal with criminal offenses? For that, you come to criminal procedure court, which is a fundamental procedural law as far as criminal courts are concerned. There are special laws which modify the provisions of criminal procedure court. But CRPC is the substantial law which applies uh, to all criminal courts. 
and the third is the law of evidence so therefore we have a combination of three laws that is laws which define criminal offenses laws which prescribe a procedure for trying such offenses and third the evidence act which is also a part of procedural law but uh, it is traditionally called a part of procedural law uh, which is also is also in uh, but now let's see how the criminal law machinery gets into motion number 1 we must first know the types of offenses crpc tells us cognizable offenses and non cognizable offenses at this stage i am not dealing with billable offenses and non billable offenses that's a separate topic but cognizable offense is something which is substratum of the crpc now there are two ways in which the criminal law machinery gets in motion the first is a person is likely to commit a cognizable offense then the criminal law machinery gets triggered and the second is that a criminal offense has already taken place then also the criminal law machinery gets moving now what do we mean by criminal law machinery gets into motion it means that the police which is supposed to protect the state and the citizens against the criminal offenses or criminal activities the police acquire the necessary powers now let's see what powers they acquire if a person is likely to commit an offense it is the duty of the police officer to prevent the occurrence of the offense and for if necessary he can arrest the person concerned all this discussion is about cognizable offenses okay we will deal with non cognizable offenses separately all right he arrests suppose the police arrest a person and prevents him from committing a cognizable offense or that the accused person has already committed a cognizable offense the police arrest him there is a power to arrest every criminal law contains the sovereign police power of the state that is power to arrest all right after he is arrested what happens the police is under an obligation to take the accused to the nearest magistrate within 24 hours that's also a constitutional guarantee as you all know article 20 of the constitution mandates am i audible hello yes sir yes sir. absolutely you are sir please continue yes now that's where the role of the court the court then has to consider whether the man is really involved whether he should be granted bail or he should be in the police custody or he should be in the judicial custody now to understand this concept um uh, in the popular parlance one is called pc and the other is called jc 
which means police custody and judicial custody. Now, what is the difference between the two? The difference is this, that in case of PC, in case of PC, the person arrested remains in the custody of the police. And in case of JC, the person concerned is in the custody of the court. And the, the person concerned, in case of JC, that is judicial custody, he goes to a local prison. And in case of PC, he remains in the custody of the police, where they usually keep him in the police station. Now let's go a step forward. So we first saw that the criminal law practice depends upon the powers of the police. Now what are their powers? One power we saw, it's a power to arrest. <clears throat> Section 41 of CRPC specifically provides. <coughs> now, when he is arrested and is taken to the magistrate, <coughs> the police have an option. <coughs> they can ask for his custody, what is called as a remand application under Section 167 of CRPC. So, magistrate applies his mind to what the police present before him, what is called as the remand application. And he decides whether there is any case against the arrested person. And even if there is a case against him, whether he should be kept in the police custody or he should be kept in the judicial custody or he should be released on bail. This is what the magistrate has to decide. But the standard practice in India is that on the first day of remand, the police custody is given. And usually, my experience shows that the magistrate hardly applies his mind. Whether, and it is in very rarest of rare cases that a person gets a bail on the first day of remand. Now, all right, he is remanded to police custody or is remanded to judicial custody. There is one important aspect. The police custody cannot exceed 15 days. So, maximum period for which a person can be kept in the custody of the police is 15 days. And thereafter, if the bail is not granted to him, he goes to judicial custody, that he goes to a local prison. Now, let's see. We identified one important pillar of the criminal law system, that is the police. Now, what powers do they have? One power we saw, arrest. The other power is of investigation. Now, what is this power of investigation? They can summon witnesses, record their statements, and try to find out whether the witnesses can throw light on the offense, if any, committed by any person. The second power that they have is to seize documents, to seize any material which is connected with the offense, like property like explosives, like weapons, like forged documents, so on and so forth. So they have a power to seize. Third is, they have power of search. They can enter premises. Namaskar. One minute. Huh? Uh, Gurmit ji? Ji. Achha, achha. Ye. मेरा जा रहा है एक लेक्चर चल रहा है कि फ्लाइट लेट हो गई ना अच्छा जी चलो कोई बात नहीं सॉरी फॉर द इंटरप्शन सो आई वाज टेलिंग यू अबाउट 
I was telling you about their power of search. One, one minute, huh? Hello. So we saw that they have a power of search and seizure. They have a power to summon witnesses and record their statements. Now, after carrying out this investigation, they submit a, a report under Section 173 of CRPC. Okay which is popularly called a chat sheet. In certain parts of the country, it is called chalan. It means a report under section 173 of CRPC. Now that report can indicate three things. Number one, that there is a case against the accused. Number two, that there is no case against the accused. Now, if there is no case against the accused, then he is to be discharged. No further thing. Now, there is specific provision in CRPC which permits the complainant, the person who has initially lost the complaint but the supreme court has read into provisions of crpc a provision that in case the police investigation report says that there is no case against the accused then the complainant must be given an opportunity of being heard in the matter now after hearing the complainant and after considering what the accused has to say and what the police have to say, if the court is of the opinion there is no case against him, the man stands discharged. Okay. But it is open to the magistrate to direct the police to carry out. So, the conduct of criminal cases is always under the control of the courts. The job of the police is to assist the courts. Now, we saw this much. Now, I will tell you what is the credible offense. As far as CRPC is concerned, if you go to schedule, first schedule to CRPC, it specifies specific offenses of IPC and against each offense there is a remark whether that is cognizable or non-cognizable. Now, what is the significance of the word cognizable? The significance is police can arrest without the warrant from the magistrate. In other words, the commission of a cognizable offense triggers the police powers without depending upon any order from the magistrate. The police act on their own. Not only act, they are under an obligation to act. Okay. Now, how do they get the information from the commission of an offense? The police can get information on their own or any person who is aware of a commission of a cognizant offense goes to the police station and makes a complaint. And the police have to examine whether the complaint discloses all the ingredients of a cognizable offense. If the complaint discloses all the ingredients of a cognizable offense, there is an obligation on the police to register a complaint in the form of what is known as first information report, 
under section 154 of CRPC. Now on this all there was a lot of debate in this country whether the police is bound to register an FIR. This controversy has been settled by Supreme Court in a case which is popularly known as Lalita Kumari's case. And this is what their lordships have said, that if the complaint contains all the ingredients of the offence, then the police must register the FIR. They have no option. Subject to this rider, the rider is, in case of matrimonial disputes, offences arising out of matrimonial dispute, the police can hold what is known as preliminary inquiry without registering an FIR. Because registration of an FIR results in serious consequences. And in the recent years, the experience of the courts is that very often, very baseless allegations are made because of matrimonial disputes. People get arrested, their life is ruined, their reputation is tarnished. Go slow, hold a preliminary inquiry, and if you find that there is some substance in the allegation, then you register the FIR. Now, I will have to have a break for a few minutes because my vehicle is getting fueled. So, the safety norms require me to switch off. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So, I will I'll just keep on. But I will not say anything. Right, sir. No problem. Disha madam, have you contacted uh, Sir Shekhar sir? I guess uh, he's having some problem. Uh, no ma'am, uh, actually he is on the fuel, he's uh, getting his uh, vehicle fueled up, so he just wants a break of 5 to 10 minutes. Okay, okay. okay. Yes, yes.
I am back, ma'am. Yes, sir. Sorry for the break. No problem, sir. But I will remember this uh, throughout my life. <laughs> so, uh, so we saw the powers of the police. We saw what is cognizable offence, and that first schedule of CRPC also tells us whether that offence is bailable or non-bailable. and it also tells us which is the court competent to try the offence so we come to know four things from first schedule offences of ipc whether they are cognizable or non cognizable whether they are bailable or non bailable and the court which is competent to try the offence so these four things we come to know from first schedule to crpc okay now though certain offences are called as non bailable even in such cases bail can be granted on certain conditions as far as bailable offences are concerned the accused is entitled to bail as of right in case of non bailable offences it's a question of discretion of the court and that discretion is exercised on certain basic parameters like seriousness of offence what is the extent of involvement of the accused person what are the chances of he running away whether there is a possibility of expeditious disposal of the trial whether any person who is a key witness is likely to be tampered with so the capacity of the accused to tamper with investigation to tamper with witnesses the seriousness of the offence the likelihood of his of his running away these are some of the parameters by which the court decides to grant or not to grant bail in non bailable cases now all right we have seen the role of the police bail non non bail no bail etc in the recent years however the inclination of the court is bail and not jail there is a a change in the judicial mind that even in the very serious economic offences or even other serious offences the bail should be granted unless there is strong possibility of the person running away or is likely to tamper now once the charge sheet is filed that once the report is filed then the courts become a little more liberal in granting bail because by that time the investigation is over so the capacity of the uh, accused to influence investigation is becomes very limited of course the possibility of tampering with the witnesses is there so appropriate conditions are placed that he will not enter a particular area where the offence took place etc and if the trial remains pending for a very long time for no fault of the accused then also the attitude of the court becomes a still more liberal in granting bail uh, now in fact there is an amendment to crpc which says that if a particular offence a particular length a number of years of punishment is prescribed and if the person at least for half of that period remains in jail or in police custody then he should be granted bail so therefore now the approach of the court towards bails is liberal because of prolonged delay there is enormous delay in now conducting criminal cases when i started my practice way back in 1974 a criminal trial 
used to get over in maximum 5 years today there are in many states cases murder cases more serious cases like dacoity are pending for 15 years 20 years without any significant progress sometimes investigations remain pending for years together there is a huge pendency in indian courts which has crossed the figure of 3 and 1/2 crores and added to that was the two years of covid where the, i am sure pendency must have crossed 4 crores i don't have the latest figure but this figure i am quoting is of some two years back so this is the scenario as far as bail is concerned now the next aspect that we have to consider is which are the courts because the concept of court in any indian legal system is that it must be established by some law now crpc constitutes magistrate of the second class magistrate of the first class the sessions court and the high court these are four courts but there are special laws like prevention of corruption act where special courts are constituted then we have posco which is very much in the news these days there is a special court posco court there is a pmla court which is a special court now these special courts also follow in substantially provisions of crpc there are some minor modifications with regard to grant of bail and some procedural aspects uh, the confession made to a police officer is made admissible under makoka in certain other uh, the special offenses otherwise under the evidence act the confession made to a police officer is not admissible in evidence so these are four courts and the special court is the fifth court the special courts are constituted under the special law the special court for the prevention of corruption act is constituted under the prevention of corruption act special posco court is constituted by posco law so on and so forth now all these courts have two important aspects of their jurisdiction one is what offenses they can try second what punishment they can impose now as far as high court and sessions courts are concerned they can impose any punishment authorized by law including death or life imprisonment but in case a death penalty is imposed by the sessions court it is required to be confirmed by the high court what we call as the confirmation proceeding so if an actual is sentenced to death then a automatically a reference is made to the high court for confirming that sentence then in while hearing the reference proceedings the high court can acquit him also so the accused need not even file an appeal or high court can reduce the sentence from death to life imprisonment but normally whenever death sentence is imposed a reference is made and the accused invariably file appeal and then his appeal and reference are heard together then other courts have their restricted power of imposing sentence magistrate of the second class first class etc some of them have 3 years some of them have 7 years some of them have less than even a year like second class magistrate have you know less than a year so the law provides that which judge can pass which sentence now the jurisdiction of the every court is with with is with reference to two things one what offense he can try and secondly what punishment 
it can impose i must also tell you that normally the high court in a criminal matter is an appellate court or a reference court for confirming the death sentence but you must also know that high court can also be a court of original jurisdiction to try a criminal case it is open to the high court to withdraw any case from any subordinate court and try it itself if the high court tries a criminal case then the appeal straight away lies to supreme court in other cases the if the sessions case imposes a punishment the appeal lies to the high court if the magistrate passes a sentence appeal lies to sessions court then from sessions court a further revision can lie to the high court and from there after a further proceeding can lie in the supreme court by way of a special petition in case of special laws like prevention of corruption act posco pmla makoka kakoka the view taken by the supreme court is that such cases must be tried only by the special courts and high court cannot try such case in its original jurisdiction but any ipc case the high court can withdraw the case from subordinate court and try it itself it is done in very rarest of rare case so we saw the powers of the court to grant a bail or refuse a bail to try the accused hold him guilty acquit him if he is held guilty appeal if he is acquitted also there can be an appeal the one important aspect we have four types of trials under crpc one is summary case now all cases under section 138 of the negotiation instruments act that is check bouncing cases as they are popularly known they are tried in a summary fashion by the magistrate now what do we mean by summary fashion it means it's a fast track court where the procedure is very limited not a very elaborate procedure then we have summons case what is a summons case is defined again by crpc where the sentence can't exceed 2 years now in case of summons case also the procedure is not very elaborate then we have warrant case warrant case consists of two types that is a warrant case which is on the basis of a police report that is section 173 report of the police warrant case is tried by a magistrate of course summary case and summons cases are also tried by magistrates the other warrant case is where a private complaint is filed it is open to any person to go and file a complaint to the magistrate under section 190 of crpc without lodging an fir then the magistrate will inquire into it now either the magistrate can direct the police to investigate if such a order is passed on the private complaint then it results into a police report under section 173 and then the police conduct the further case that is warrant case on a police report but suppose the magistrate does not direct the police to investigate 
he allows the private complainant to conduct the case then it's a warrant case otherwise than a police report then we have the sessions case which is tried by sessions court and where the procedure is very very elaborate the there is a framing of the charge before framing of the charge the accused person is heard the prosecuting counsel is heard thereafter the charge is framed at that stage it is open to the accused to, to argue for discharge now there is a difference between discharge and acquittal if a person is discharged then if some evidence subsequently comes he can be tried but if he is acquitted then the matter comes to an end of course subject to appeal now this is what i have attempted to <coughs> place before you a birds i view of the criminal law practice there are many finer aspects which it is not possible for me to cover in such a short space of time because criminal law practice involves so many nicer aspects finer aspects that it will take many more hours for me to convey even the tip of the iceberg but i have tried to convey to you my understanding of the fundamentals of criminal justice system and i thank organizers rajesh ji disha ji and everybody the faculty for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to, to share whatever bit that i have learned in the profession thank you very much thank you so much sir uh, despite the disturbances and adversities and your busy schedule you could give us so much time thank you so much uh, sir i guess that rajesh sir has lost connection as he was in a low network area uh, but i whole heartedly you uh, heartedly thank you sir and i expect that uh, we collaborate in future also thank you so much sir sure sir in better environment yes yes uh, sure sir maybe, maybe uh, in a physical thing which is more effective because uh, you can have an eyeball to eyeball contact and see what the response of the people is absolutely okay, thank, sir. You, much, thank, you, thank, so you. Much, sir. thank you so much sir thank you so much for joining yeah. sir can we end the meeting Sir, can we end it now?